people thought, my gosh, if there can be an orchestra with girls and boys playing side by side that's based in a school uh, that's performing music from around the world with a combination of Afghan, Indian, and, and Western teachers, you know, that's an Afghanistan that can be at peace. Hello, everybody, and welcome to COVID Classical, a playlist for our troubled times. My name is Dane Lam, and I am principal conductor of the Xi'an Symphony in China, and I conduct uh, orchestras and at opera houses all over the world. At least I did before this COVID-19 crisis that we're currently facing and we're all being locked down in our homes. Every week, I will curate a special playlist based on an emotion or a certain character trait that we draw upon in this time in lockdown, expressed through some of the most beautiful, heart-rending, soulful classical music ever written. So we've had hope, we've had humour, we've had desire, we've had despair. This week is a character trait that we really do need to draw on to get us through our days, and that is courage. Courage can take so many forms. There's the sort of autobiographical courage that draws on experiences in the composer's own life when he or she was composing against all odds under great duress in the depths of despair. There is the courage that comes from blazing a new artistic revolutionary compositional path that many composers over the centuries have employed to take us forward, to take music forward and to communicate with us in all kinds of new ways. And there's the musicians themselves who actually played the music, who undertook the performances of some great works of music under very trying circumstances. It's the inspiration of these different people, these different artists that we can draw on this week. And I'm really pleased to welcome the guest for this week's edition of COVID Classical, Courage. Our guest this week is an old friend from my days studying at Juilliard in New York, the Juilliard School. His name is William Harvey and he is one of the most fantastic concert masters around. He is a violinist, he is a composer, and he's an advocate for the arts. At the moment, William is the concert master of the National Symphony Orchestra of Mexico. Before that, he's led orchestras in Argentina, in the United States. He's the founder of Cultures in Harmony, an organization that looks to bring together people through music through diverse backgrounds and diverse styles to really find our commonality through art and music. And he also was a professor of violin and conductor and founder of the Afghan Youth Orchestra in Kabul, Afghanistan, at the Afghanistan National Institute of Music. This is a very inspiring story of someone who went into a war-torn country post-September 11, post-Taliban, and helped to use music to give hope, to educate people, to give music as a way of, of, of survival, or as a way of living, not just an added extra, but something that is vital to our own expression and to the community's cohesiveness. And so it gives me great pleasure to talk about all things courage and music with William Harvey. Just one small thing. You know that we're all in isolation at the moment and internet bandwidth and connection can be a tricky little thing. William actually recorded this Zoom interview from just outside Mexico City in a, in a semi-rural part on the outskirts of Mexico City. It's actually from his wife's ranch for dogs. And so the connection is not fantastic at times, but the audio is really fantastic, almost perfect as compared to the video. So if you can bear with it, William has some real insights on courage in music. And I think in the spirit of this very crazy isolation period that we're in, it's really worth a listen. So thanks for bearing with us. Well, thank you very much, William, for coming on COVID Classical. William Harvey, 
the concert master of the National Orchestra of Mexico. Welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's great to have you. Now, I'm just going to launch straight into it. And this whole episode is about courage in music and courage as a way of getting us through some of the tough times in life, such as this current crisis. What Mm -hmm. does the word courage mean to you? Well, specifically for a musician, I think it means a willingness to believe that music can and should occupy a central role in society. It's not merely something to provide entertainment for a couple hours every Friday night. Um, It can act as an agent uh, of social change Uh, in fairly dramatic ways. And I think more and more musicians are understanding this. And you have uh, just recently, last year, a new organization launched the Lewis Prize for Music, which specifically rewards um, organizations that understand this. And I think the, the inaugural top prize, uh, among others, they gave to uh, Community Music Works in Rhode Island, which uh, the founder had already won a MacArthur Genius Grant. But it's it's an organization that understands that, that music can be about bringing different communities together, empowering people from a variety of socioeconomic backgrounds. And uh, certainly this is a, a credo I've tried to live in my own life as the founder of Cultures in Harmony, which promotes cultural understanding through music and also having taught four years in Afghanistan at Afghanistan National Institute of Music. Yeah, it's it's really what makes it for us as musicians, isn't it, that we have this, this art to share that is not just entertainment, but that can really enrich people's lives and challenge them. Can you speak a little bit to, we've spoken about the extrinsic qualities of courage in music making and in, and in art. Are there any intrinsic characters that, that pertain to courage in music? Yes, I think that, uh, yeah, if you look at courage outside of that sort of real world context I just mentioned and in a more abstract sense, you know, there's, there's ways in which composers uh, show courage. Um, I am actually just preparing now to talk about, uh, do a, another one of these online chats about Mahler's Seventh Symphony. And what I, I think in that, Mahler shows a certain amount of courage in that it's a work that is often called progressive, but it also has certain conservative elements as well, uh, romanticism and uh, sentimentality. And so I, I think for a complete Poser, perhaps, courage can be a willingness to strike out a path that is not easily categorized uh, for performers. Um, also, it can be, you know, sticking to your guns with a really unusual interpretation, uh, perhaps. Um, you mentioned Mahler's Seventh Symphony, and he's a composer that I think we'll be focusing on in the playlist this week. What specifically about the Seventh Symphony? do you find that, that, that Mahler exhibits courage in the music? Well, in, in that symphony in particular, you know, he, he did make a lot of decisions which were later seen as progressive, such as um, taking the, the harmony, I think, uh, to a point where it, it, it changes so kaleidoscopically and so instantaneously that if if you start to look at it in a very granular way, it almost becomes a tonal. And then, of course, you have that opening motive, dun, 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 which uh, sounds almost like the sort of uh, cell that out, exists outside of tonality that later atonal composers would base entire compositions on. And then, you know, orchestration, making, you know, adding guitar and mandolin using tenor horn, The way, in fact, that the guitar and mandolin are used ends up feeling very conservative, I think. And then the the first movement as well is some really gorgeous and lush romantic writing. Um, And so I think it takes some courage to know that you're going to make different people 
happy about some things and angry about other things at the same time. In terms of courage, I think the challenge then for a composer today is to figure out, well, you know, if anything can be done, if I can write in any style, you know, who am I to say that what I'm going to express is going to be one of the things that's going to connect with people? You've proven yourself to be incredibly adaptable over the course of your musical life. And I'd really like to just focus in on your time that you spent in Afghanistan, in Kabul, at the Afghan National Institute of Music. Uh, were you there from the very beginning? Well, yeah, I was the first foreign teacher to arrive. The school was founded by Dr. Ahmad Sarmast, who's the first Afghan with a doctorate in musicology. And uh, he had been outside of Afghanistan and Australia uh, during the uh, fall of the Taliban. And I think started to go back just a few years later, maybe in 2005 or six, uh, to see what the country would need. Because, of course, the, the Taliban is the only... Uh, government to ban music nationwide for five years. Uh, and the rubab, for instance, is the national instrument of Afghanistan. And that, that was its performance, its study was not permitted, which was devastating for people who feel that it's the soul of Afghanistan. And the sound of the rubab is the soul of Afghanistan. In fact, jumping ahead a bit, I remember that many times I would write speeches for Dr. Sarmas to, uh, to give it at important occasions, and I would often include the line um, uh, that what the work that we're doing here at the music school in Kabul uh, is so that the strings of the rubab will never again fall silent in Afghanistan. Um, so yeah, his, his work was amazing. And he got funding from the World Bank and from a variety of embassies uh, to bring in foreign teachers to teach instruments that used to be performed and studied in the days when his father was the first Afghan conductor and arranger in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, and a lot of the Western instruments had existed in his father's orchestra, and simply there, there were no qualified performers or teachers anymore. So I arrived on um, Afghan New Year's Day, March 21st, 2010, uh, to be the, the first of the foreign teachers to arrive. Um, and I taught violin and viola, and he very quickly asked me also to form the Afghan Youth Orchestra, which uh, just um, three years after its founding, we took to Carnegie Hall and the Kennedy Center on a sold out tour. So I think yeah, that, that was a wonderful it, story. Too. Oh, it was, it was yeah. great. And the Afghan Youth Orchestra, too, we also I conducted them eight times for President Hamid Karzai. And I think the reason it was so inspiring to people both within Afghanistan and around the world is um, it had boys and girls performing side by side, Afghan and Western instruments side by side. Um, and, you know, I would also make sort of arrangements uh, like the Four Seasons of Afghanistan, taking the Vivaldi and adding Afghan instruments, rhythms and melodies. And, and it, people thought, my gosh, if there can be an orchestra with girls and boys playing side by side that's based at a school, uh, that's performing music from around the world with a combination of Afghan, Indian, and, and Western teachers, you know, that's an Afghanistan that can be at peace. Now, unfortunately, that, that assumption, I think, has been tested more and more as time has gone on. I actually felt during my four years there, 2010 to 2014, that things were getting better and better. And I think, unfortunately, recently, things have gotten worse. And you know, so there, there, are, there are very serious things where it can seem for a time like uh, music has very little to say or very little to offer. But um, I can attest to the fact that during those four years, many Afghans would tell Dr. Sarmast, myself, the, the other teachers and the students that what we were doing had the had the, so much value that it was as though each one of our students who were, keep in mind, were as young as 10 years old, they said each one of your students is like uh, an ambassador or, or a cabinet minister in terms of their impact. Because it, it, it wasn't just the fact that you were teaching people how to play music, how to play Western music, how to play uh, Afghan traditional music, 
but it was very significant in that they were there were girls there were females that you were teaching right yeah yeah and if you look at the documentary there's a very good documentary about the early years of the school that was um released on al jazeera uh and is now available on youtube and there's a scene in the documentary where um dr sarmast helped me deal with an issue relating to that which was that um, my female students would come in with the headscarf so tightly wrapped around their head or, or so many layers rather that there was no space for the violin and you know the violin should be in very close contact with the neck and so Dr. Sarmast came in and talked to them and helped them come up with a style of the headscarf that still covered their hair because that's what they were concerned about because that's what they've been taught to believe uh, but yet allowed the violin to come into contact with, um, with the neck. And, uh, so, you know, he, he was, he's a, really a, a genius uh, of the first order because he, he can, I found he could solve practically any problem. And, and he's, he's the real, I think, profile and courage in music, you know, for many, many years, the, you know, we were always thinking, wait, why aren't, the Taliban targeting us because we're we're teaching music and we have we're the, we were the only school in Afghanistan that was co-educational. Tragically, in December of, of 2014, um, he was perhaps targeted. We're, I don't think we're still not exactly sure, but our students were playing uh, music for a play that was criticizing the Taliban's use of. Uh, of suicide bombers and in a tragic irony the taliban did send a suicide bomber to that play and uh, dr sarmas did receive uh, shrapnel but did survive so so i think he's a, a fairly unusual example of someone who is using courage in a very traditional sense to be a musician to be a music educator and really is is risking his life for that so you know he he won the, the Polar Music Prize, which is perhaps music's most uh, prestigious award. But I, you know, I'd like to see him get a, a Nobel Peace Prize because I think that, you know, someone like him or, or moving perhaps to names, other names that, that your audience would know, people like Daniel Berenboim, Yo-Yo Ma, you know, people who have the vision to understand what music can accomplish in modern society. To me, that that's what I see as courage, and those are people who I try to emulate. It's music that actually changes the world. I mean, we can wax lyrical about it, but people like Dr. Samast actually embody that, don't they? Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah. what would what was your when you were there in in Kabul in Afghanistan? Did you have to become conversant a with the language or the languages? And also oh, yeah. with the different uh, instruments and the different musical styles. Yeah, I speak Dari. Khud Dari gap me zanam. Hish moskel nist. Yeah, it's, uh, that was very important to me. I made a big effort from the beginning. And, um, you know, I loved spending time with the Afghan teachers of Afghan instruments and learning about the rubab, the sitar, which, you know, the sitar, you know, the world thinks of it as an Indian instrument. In uh, Pakistan, they would tell you it's a South Asian instrument. And in Afghanistan, they would tell you it's an Indo-Afghan instrument. Um, so the terminology is depending on the politics, but there's sitar tabla in Afghanistan. And then, but rubab is really more specific to Afghanistan. And so are some other instruments like kichak, which is a Northern Afghanistan, um, like the Badakhshan province. So, you know, I love, I loved that stuff. I remember as soon after I arrived spending hours with Ustad Murat, the, the kichak teacher to learn more about that instrument. And then you played in an orchestra with Western instruments and Afghan instruments. How did you put them together? Well, um, the orchestra actually was one that I, I conducted. I, I didn't ever really play in it. And uh, I would make a range. And if one student graduated and another student came into the orchestra, I would just go back to my Sibelius, tinker with the arrangement and print out a new part. Wonderful. So you just had to be so versatile and so adaptable. And after I'm, Afghanistan, you, you went 
you, you went to Mexico, is that right? Well, no, I actually, my, so I should say, I, since 2005, I'm the founder and director of Cultures and Harmony, this NGO where we've done over 40 projects in over 16 countries promoting cultural understanding through music. And that was something that I, it was inspired directly by my experience of being in New York on September 11th, playing for some uh, soldiers as they came back from working at Ground Zero five days after September 11th. And then reflecting on that experience and realizing the enormous impact music can have if we choose to believe in that. And Cultures in Harmony has done some really amazing work over the years, performing with Pakistani musicians in schools, collaborating with musicians in Cameroon to perform in prisons and orphanage and centers for uh, leprosy um, victims. In Tunisia, we go every summer to teach young musicians there. And, and really, through the universal language of music, uh, create a better model for what the relationship between the United States and the rest of the world could look like. I, I wanted to celebrate that aspect of America, and I will admit to being crushed when uh, the November 2016 election showed that for a lot of people, there's one definition of American culture, which is America first, and, uh, and I'm sorry to say, you know, in my opinion, for the people who voted for Trump, it's sort of about you know, putting white people at the apex of the of the social hierarchy, which which I very strongly condemn, and so I didn't want anything to do with that. And I thought, um, well, Trump spent his whole campaign criticizing Mexico. Why don't I move to Mexico and show them that we're not all like that? So I went to musical chairs and searched for jobs in uh, Mexico and found one as concertmaster in Culiacan. Uh, Sinaloa. So I was there for about 10 months before the job as uh, concertmaster of the National Symphony Orchestra opened up. And then I, I moved here to Mexico City in January 2018. And I, I will say what I've enjoyed about Mexico versus uh, United States or Afghanistan is that in United States, certainly, um, th th I think there's always been this sense that that music is this thing that just occurs on a Friday night for wealthy people who who already know that they like it. Um, and I'm, I'm glad to see that that's changed, I think, a lot in the last 10 years and that there is more social consciousness among classical musicians. But Afghanistan, in a way, was the polar opposite, where everyone understood exactly how important music is and were fighting literally for a country in which it was it would either be safe to have music or where it would be illegal to have music and mexico is sort of a nice uh, middle ground and that i think here culture is very important and always has been and you know the national symphony gets a spectrum of ages and demographics that you would probably not see at most american symphony orchestra concerts Fine, because you've gone from from making music in Kabul, you've played in Carnegie Hall, you've played on the New York subway, the Paganini Caprices. There are so many orchestras, cultural institutions, opera houses, who are looking to connect with audiences beyond the concert hall, beyond the opera theater. And it seems that you've lived that in your life. If you could give them any advice, if you could give the CEO, if you give the president of a major symphony orchestra any advice on how to connect, what would you what would you recommend? I think that the models are out there, and what I would hope that orchestras, big orchestras, will do um, is conceive of themselves in a in a fully holistic fashion, where you know members are engaging communities, creating compositions with them. Uh, finding out what's important to them. And for instance, what Cultures in Harmony is trying to do right now, we're launching this new platform, which we're tentatively calling Connecting Cultures Through Counterpoint. The idea being to answer the question, how can we create value both during and after the pandemic? Because a lot of arts organizations are doing these really inspiring videos where like everyone gets on their Zoom and records their part for Bolero or something like that. That's great, but you know darn well that as soon as this is over, every audience member is going to say, I prefer to go to the hall and hear the bolero live 
Uh, whereas I think what the pandemic can force us to do is to be creative about ways in which we can create value that will still exist when the new normal arrives. For instance, Cultures in Harmony in our last 15 years, we send groups of musicians to places like Zimbabwe or Cameroon or even Papua New Guinea. And in order to do that, we have to raise a heck of a lot of money for some very expensive plane tickets. And so it occurred to me, well, why not use Zoom, use an app like I, I still haven't, I have to admit, gotten to know all these apps, but I think there's one called Acapella where you can sort of yeah. create different tracks and put different things together and then put it on YouTube where, you know, you have a song where someone's recording in Tunisia, someone else is recording in the Congo, uh, someone else in Mexico, someone else in the U.S. and, and the percussionist from, from the Philippines, maybe. And, you know, and we have the contacts in these countries to pull the, this off. I just, I'm a little bit nervous. I'm, I'm still not sure how centralized versus decentralized to make it. And, you know, I want people to to join that Facebook group. It's called Connecting Cultures Through Counterpoint. And I want it to be an organic place where someone can say, you know what, I, I want to record a song with a Nigerian drummer living in Cameroon and a an Mbira player from Zimbabwe and maybe a rock guitarist from Egypt. And, and anyone can, can post these requests on the on the board. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to encourage more people to make posts. Recently, I've been the one making most of the posts, but I think that we, we all have to get creative about, you know, what are we doing now that we're going to stop doing when the new normal arrives? Yeah, it's food for thought and it's inspiring. Just one thought that I had as, as you were talking about this hunger for music that you found in Afghanistan contrasted with a very sort of crystal tower highfalutin notion of classical music in america and and mexico being the middle ground do you think there is a correlation between the standard of living between persecution and the need for art the need for music i think that the challenge implicit in your question is that when societies as a whole be, become healthier uh, and in a financial sense, in a sense of stability, in a sense of justice for all, you know, sometimes the value of something like music can feel trivial. And I would ask people to remember that it's not, and I would ask musicians to continue finding ways to show that it's not. Every, every single classical musician is also an ambassador, just as much as if they were an ambassador, uh, you know, of the United States or of the of the United Kingdom. They, they are an ambassador to convince people that what we offer has value, because it's the marketplace of things that people have access to is just so enormous that you just can't expect that the spine tingling climax at the end of uh, Mahler 7th is going to automatically connect with everyone. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Yeah, that's right. And I think that this current crisis has really hit home the value of the arts and the value of music for us. And so if you were, if you were to pick one piece of music that epitomizes courage to you, what would you pick, William? Um, there are many ways to approach the question. I mean, one thing that immediately comes to mind is, is Quartet for the End of Time by Messiaen because yeah. of where it was written in a concentration camp. Um, and, you know, having that courage to make music in the face of, uh, in the face of possible death is really quite something. I think if you want to find a piece of music that is both a great piece of music and represents courage in the real world, as well as in an abstract sense in terms of sticking to its own musical path and expressing its own style in a way that is uncompromising, Quartet for the End of Time. Yeah, I think that is such an apt choice. and. It's been wonderful talking with you about courage in music and about your 
travels and in music around the world. So thank you very much coming from, from rural Mexico. Well, yeah, the Mexico City in the, in the south where my, uh, it's, it's sort of almost outside the city where my wife has a dog ranch for re rescued dogs. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. It's been great talking to you. Great talking to you. Thanks, William. Thank you.